Dave, I'm gonna, what were you saying about the improv workshop? Uh, that I uh, did a two-hour thing for the uh, Open Security Summit, which is still going on all this week online. Uh, and the uh, slides I post in the chat, and the, the two-hour video is uh, online for the workshop oh, I did. Nice. Uh, okay. You can check it out if you want to learn or if you're having uh, trouble going to sleep. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> so it's useful. Learning or filler noise. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Um Really good to see you again, Mandy. Uh, your laugh is great. It's good to hear. Oh, cool. Good. That's. It. I didn't realize you were doing that with the improv, but um, last year I got to spearhead and create the whole uh, hacker stand-up comedy at B-Sides Las Vegas and performed stand-up for the first time. And oh, man. About seven other um, InfoSec professionals that were newbies to comedy. And then uh, Banjo Crashland, yeah, he opened for us Excellent. and everything. And we did a two-night thing during B-Sides Las Vegas and had wow. a presentation and gave award. Like they then whoever their favorite was got to headline the next night. Um, nice. It was wonderful and it was great. Like I loved and it. it actually came about for me in a connected way to doing this for mental health hackers mm -hmm. because of finding comedy to be so healing and yep. a way to just relax everybody at once if they're into it, you know, not everybody. But. Yeah. I've never tried stand up. I'm not sure I could, but the improv for me is huge good. for, uh, for mental, uh, uh, health. You know, if, if I've I been was, uh, watching more improv and yeah. I haven't done, well, I've done a lot of extemporaneous speaking, I guess, throughout mm -hmm. life, but yeah. I've not done improv. Doing the stand up was awesome, but I liked it because I did all disability humor and yeah. it was great to me. <laughs> oh, I'm going to uh, post a link here. A friend of mine uh, was a professional comedian out in San Francisco and he was in a wheelchair. So his business card said 100% comedy, 0% stand up. Nice. And uh, he found a, a blind comedian out there. They got uh, together, and then between them, they found a little person comedian and a stuttering dyslexic comedian, and they formed the Comedians with Disabilities Act. And they would tour together once a quarter. Oh my gosh, they have, they have an album recorded. Uh, his awesome. parts are free, my friend. He passed away a couple years ago, but really, really funny stuff. I'm gonna have to look that up. Yeah, I adore. I adore all of that. I think you learn and you get so much relief, but you're also, in my mind, it's like you're learning about people and their struggles and what their lives are like in a way that's incredibly accessible. Um, yeah. As long as you're open to having a sense of humor. Not everybody has, <laughs> not everybody operates the same way, like where I survive by humor. So mm. I respect that. Yep. So, all right, I'm going to progress us through the rest of our slides and move us into the presentation here momentarily. Uh, just go over a quick couple more groups in the area. So we have the WordPress meetup in Southwest Florida. They're a fairly active WordPress group. We have Southwest Florida Coders and Southwest Florida Regional Technology Partnership. Southwest Florida Data Meetup, which is Daniel, who's on the channel. Uh, Daniel, do you want to give a quick blurb about your meetup group? Yeah, I'll make it quick. So the Summer Florida Data Meetup is all about uh, data, as the name says. Uh, so we try to focus on uh, data visualization, uh, data analytics, um, and everything else that can be possibly related to data. Uh, so we meet once a month on the first Monday of the month. Um, I'll post a, a couple of links on the chat if you're interested in learning more. There's also a podcast that I started a couple of weeks ago with data-related topics. Um, so yeah, thanks, Mike. And what's the podcast called? Uh, the podcast is called Data Basement, and you can find it in Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts, and a few other places. I'll, I'll post the website, too, so yeah. you can find it easier. Fantastic. Thanks. And then we have Pi Ladies of Southwest Florida, which you can imagine is all about Python and women in programming. So uh, we're looking forward to them growing in this area, too. Hey, upcoming events, uh, Florida, Southwest Florida Regional Technology Partnership this Thursday, 
is hosting a talk on cybersecurity in the COVID-19 world and beyond. They'll have a panel of three or four uh, area experts uh, talking about that. I don't know if we have anybody here from Southwest Florida Regional, Te Regional Technology Partnership or not. Go through the list, it does not look like it. Okay, otherwise we can have them talk about it real quick. Uh, Southwest Florida Coders and OWASP Bonita Springs will be actually combining for a meeting. Uh, we're still working on finalizing everything, but it looks to be July 9th. Uh, we will have, um, sure I'm forgetting the company actually. Uh, the talk will be along the lines of mobile app sec. So that should be an interesting meetup. Uh, again, that'll be virtual at 6.30 PM. Links will go out uh, from both, I think from both of our uh, meetup pages and of course our Slack groups too. Uh, our next meeting, Southwest Florida SEC, is going to be July 21st. Again, like I said before, it'll be live and virtual, so it'll be a hybrid. We'll be back in 239 Works co-share and co-working space. Uh, no topic yet, so that's still to be determined. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, we have Southwest Florida data meetup coming up on July 7th. Is that the right date? Yeah, I guess so. July 7th. No, July 6th. That is not the right date. Sorry about that, Daniel. July 6th. Good thing we can, we can just edit this live. <laughs> um, then, uh, John, I see you're on here. Do you want to give a quick blurb about Sarasota InfoSec community? Yes, yeah, Sarasota InfoSec community just had a talk on uh, June 9th. Um, and that was our first virtual talk. It all depends on um, how, how the situation is to whether it's going to be virtual again. But we have two more planned. They're not for not till October. We have a meet and drink on October 3rd, and then we have our next uh, InfoSec talk with Stacy Banks, uh, potentially at the Carlisle Inn or virtual on October 20th. Fantastic, thank you so much. And then we have Hack Miami, uh, June 20th, coming up this Saturday. I do not recall if they'll actually still be virtual or not. Their last few meetings have been virtual, but when I looked at their meetup page, they didn't have a virtual link yet. Uh, meet, they generally split into two different talks for two hours. They have a physical pen testing and then intro to red team. Okay, now we got a section for our attendees for the meetup. Uh, if anybody out there has a need, is looking for work, or no, or is working for a company who's looking for new employees, uh, or you just want to, you just have some other need, uh, this is your time. So uh, grab a mic and reach out. Actually, before we jump into that, Shane, did you have something to add for the calendar? I did, if I can do a shameless plug here real fast. Of Always. Um, <laughs> we have not announced this to the world yet, so I'm going to let you guys know first. Um, we are going to do what we're tentatively calling ILF Fest, and it'll be on July the 25th. And uh, many of you guys may know uh, the Cyber Mentor. Uh, Heath. Yeah. Heath is going to be hosting that for us. We're going to attempt to raise $10,000. That's our goal. Um, and so we're going to have, uh, believe it or not, Chris, Chris Hadnag has been posting some cooking stuff. And all of a sudden, he's getting all these requests for people wanting to teach him how to cook. So we're going to do a little bit of time with Chris cooking. Um, we're going to uh, have um, Heath and Chris just doing some chatting. If you guys uh, know Zoe by any chance, um, and I'm coming up with a loss at her last name at the moment. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, she's verbal out there, if you guys know verbal. Um, and Chris Roberts, so they're going to be there. Also, uh, Dave Kennedy has agreed to join. Great. So he's going to sit down and spend some time with Chris. Uh, they're going to do some gaming, and then to top it all off, if you are a fan of rock and roll music, you may know Clutch, and uh, the lead singer of Clutch is uh, uh, Neil, and Neil has offered to bring his acoustic guitar and do a little fireside chat and drink some whiskey with everybody. So um, that's the tentative lineup. Plenty of things could change, but July 25th, everyone's invited. So thanks. Great, thanks, Shane. It sounds like an exciting event. 
Uh, are you going to be doing it on Twitch? Are you, how, how is the event going to occur? We're, we're going to be doing it on Twitch and um, Heath is, Heath is going to handle all that. The cyber mentor is mm -hmm. going to handle all the logistics for us. Fantastic. Well, thanks for thanks. announcing and giving us the exclusive because you know, this is going to be posted publicly afterwards. Yeah. So we're honored. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Steven, did you have something as well? I do not. Okay. Does anybody else have announcements, needs, or wants? Uh, here's a, a want. I'm working with uh, a company using AI for resumes to find better job matches and streamline the uh, HR and hiring process. If you uh, have any access to uh, large data sets of resumes or job postings, I would love to hear them. Dave, if you don't mind, like contact me again on that because I think I may, in case I forget to contact you again. Excellent, sounds great, thanks. Um, and you're talking about jobs. I know that risk-based security out of Virginia is looking for several, they're based in like Richmond, Virginia area, had several openings. That was just the most recent one I saw. All right. All right, I'm going to mention that our employer, I guess Michelle, I think it's okay because it's posted publicly. Uh, our employer is looking for a couple different positions as well. Uh, I think we're still looking for a senior director in information security. And we are looking on the infrastructure side for an, a security uh, lead who will uh, be working with the firewalls and segmentation. The network and position. I think there's a couple more that will be posted in the future, but they're not posted yet. And okay. we can talk about those once they are posted. Sure. And I think a couple are going to be remote offered positions and which the more senior ones and the more junior ones will be on site positions for the Naples area. Which I don't know why people don't want to move here. I mean, yeah. Naples is fantastic. I, I keep doing the same thing. It's like I talk to people whose positions come up. It's like nobody wants to move to Naples. It's like, really? <laughs> but then I, I, I think about, you know, they have kids and they want a bigger area for their kids to be in, you know, more city type of area with a lot more uh, opportunities. And that might be one of the uh, items that either does or does not draw people to the area. Yeah, sure. I, I noticed from where I came from, this feels extremely urban. And I know it's not as yeah. urban as like Miami or Tampa, <laughs> but I, I came from, you know, Southwest Michigan, which is very rural, uh, big farm communities with big properties around the houses. So uh, I come here and, and look at the houses and they're about this close to each other. Um, there, there's nothing that really, you know, yeah. it's hard to do anything in a yard that big. Yeah. And I came from Atlanta. Uh, so I, I think it's beautiful down here. You know, you see palm trees every day and you can see the ocean uh, whenever you want to drive over to it. So I definitely think it's a really nice area to live in when the opportunities open up. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the biggest draws for us was just the, the, the inherent beauty of the area. I mean, you get, it is a sunshine state, but the sunshine down here is different from the yeah. sunshine even in Jacksonville. So mm -hmm. yeah. uh, not to pick on Jacksonville at all, but uh, I noticed that when it's 105 degrees up there, we're still like 80 to 90 down here. So um, I guess there's something to be said for, you know, being subtropical uh, right by the Gulf around the bend was that by the, what I forget that I always forget what they call the area between Cuba and South Florida, but there's that pass through. Uh, I think our weather, uh, of course, it's usually impacted by that. Just having a breeze almost every day. And like you said, seeing those palm trees, when you wake up and when you go to sleep and yeah, it's been great for us and no gray skies like back up in Michigan. So, uh, anyways, all right. So if there isn't any other, uh, announcements, once needs, we'll go ahead and continue on. Just one question regarding these uh, open positions. My employer has found out on that be pods has found out when looking for these positions that now because of COVID, there's a lot more ask for a hundred percent remote. Are you guys experiencing the same thing? I'm going to give that one to Michelle. I, my impression is that people really want to work remote. And I know it's uh, associated a little bit with COVID, but more so from the fact that they don't want to relocate 
this far down into Florida. Okay. Um, and I'm not, when I was looking for a job down here, because it actually took me about five years to get a job with my current company. And I was looking for this level of position for, for that period of time. And it, there just were not that many opportunities in this area. Uh, I actually applied to the company for a position three years previously. And then uh, after the three years, another position came up and I applied and went through the interview process and got it. But I think in the organization, there is still a culture where they want to see people for the most part, you know, maybe some telecommute, but primarily wanted to see them face to face a few days a week. Um, so even if people may want to request telecommuting from other locations, uh, I don't know if the if the management actually has that uh, desire to have a, you know, a high number of people who are working remotely. Sure, just curious because for me it's changed. I wasn't gonna work remote at all. Now I'd be open to a 100% remote position. I'm seeing that other places and Sarasota is very similar that uh, there's not a lot of jobs here. And a lot of the mm -hmm. people who are in the industry are working remote positions in other states anyway. Uh, so it's hard to know how many open positions there are here and it's hard to get people to move to Sarasota. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, that's another nice place, John. It's like you got not only Sarasota, but you got CSDP right off the beach and right up the beach. How's that work out anyways? You're also <laughs> closer so, to uh, like, Tampa and St. Petersburg, very popular areas with lots of stuff to do there. Both that's where out, I work. You know, that's the, what I work out of. Most people do is they they make that hour and a half commute um, to to do that. So, hmm. I don't I don't know if I could do an hour and a half commute. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. Getting too old. Yeah. Um, an hour and a half each way too. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. And be stuck on one of those bridges if you're going across the bay. Uh, okay. That's why I didn't take a job at Key West when I was offered. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and that's one of the things down here too, and, and trying to build up this communicate community in Southwest Florida, you know, we, we mentioned, you know, that it is underserved. Um, there isn't, there's not a large amount of big employers here. Um, certainly we've got my employer, uh, which is a large a medical device company here in Southwest Florida. Uh, we've got Chico, Ch what is it? Chico's, Chino's? Chico's, Chico's. Hertz. Yeah, Chico's. Um, well, Hertz, 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 for now, still uh, around. I don't know. <laughs> they they uh, filed for chapter 11 bankruptcy, so we'll see. Yeah, they, they yeah. laid off quite a few people. That building is really mm -hmm. empty. But they got Herc still. Herc is still in the area. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what that is, it's just like the heavy machinery version of Hertz where they rent it out to different companies. But that's still in the area. It's still a fairly decently large employer. They don't call it megahertz. <laughs> where's where's my drum sound? Uh, no, that, that, that would be a, I think that would be a branding issue. But uh, although the name would be you know a lot funnier. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and then as far and then we kind of fall off after that. And then it gets into uh, your services industry, yeah. your hospitality, your medical, hospitality, financial. Medical. You got uh, like. The big ones like the school district is, you know, obviously very large. Yeah, Collier County is a pretty large county, is what I'm finding out. Is there any military down there? Not so much. And I actually was in the military for 12 years, so I would say no, <laughs> not here. Okay. I think that's back up to Tampa. Yeah, uh, yeah, up towards the uh, or or Miami. The, yeah, or over Miami. on the east coast or up towards the north part of the state on the Gulf there and around Orlando for some reason. I mean, we have Fort Meyer, but it's not really military. So mm -hmm. <laughs> just maintain the name. Uh, okay. Well, I think that's it for tell us your needs. And so I'm going to roll on over to Mandy. Uh, welcome to our little meetup mm -hmm. group. And we're really excited for your talk. So I've, I've just got your what you sent for your synopsis for the talk in your bio, but you can go ahead and talk towards that. I'm going to turn over uh, sharing to you. Once I find the sharing button. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, I'm all set. Okay, let's see. Okay. So I'm hoping everyone can see that. Yes. Yep. We're good. All right. So first for this presentation, um, which I do want to thank you all for allowing me this opportunity to share with you. Um, Mike, when he approached Amanda for mental health hackers, and then she in turn approached me about speaking with your group, um, he had expressed how concerned he was and how much care he wanted to give to the group because of the intense stress and how uh, things have just been so <laughs> in such upheaval recently that he really wanted to give a, a feel good talk, a mental health focused talk that would hopefully provide comfort and that is why I am here. So um, for right now, see a couple of things to know about me as I told Mike um, and if you read my bio you know that I had strokes and major head injuries and so I tend to speak more slowly <laughs> than a lot of people. If my speech or vision get too fatigued and they go out the presentation will end early and I want to thank you all <laughs> ahead of time. Um, there's not much likelihood of that, but it has happened in the past. Um, in fact, last year I was doing the keynote for RVA SEC, a conference in Virginia, and my vision went out and so I had to do the thing <laughs> in front of hundreds of people with having no, no eyesight, but it went okay. So now I'm at least in a safe home. This isn't a big deal here. Um, so the plan for this evening, there's gonna be an intro, of course. Then I am going to be sharing a journal entry of something that happened back in December. Um, I'll go over some particulars of how I installed new code internally to be able to receive good. I'm gonna to touch on some laws of unconditional love that have been very useful to me and then we open for chat. So title, whoops, what's happening? Um, sorry, these, the Zoom thing popped up and now it's blocking me getting back. Okay, so the title of this talk, When Warriors Accept Good, or you could say, Good Doesn't Easily Integrate. Um, all of these letters behind my name come from certifications from my previous life prior to the injuries and strokes. I specialize in environmental engineering, construction management, um, and that is what my certifications and background are in. I inspected large commercial construction sites. I grew up in construction and operating heavy equipment and doing a lot of things like that, so that is more of my background. Um, again, for any here who aren't familiar with mental health hackers, you know that Mike was kind enough to reach out to mental health hackers and request this talk. And if you, so they offer uh, a Slack, there's a veterans group, a veteran specific group, and then there are, at conferences, there are rooms and presentations and information set up from peers to help other InfoSec professionals with their mental health and emotional stability and dealing with life. Um, and I wanna thank you all for letting me be here. They are, you can contact Hackers Health or get in touch with any of this stuff, either through the Twitter handle or through their, their um, website right there. So, going to start with this slide. Now, as of this moment, what I'm going to invite everybody to do is 
that as you are comfortable, think about this virtually, like you're just sitting up on the couch with me. This is a calm, easy space. You don't need to do anything. Um, you're just going to listen to part of my experience. And in that, the intention and plan is that you will find something that can comfort and aid you. The things that are listed here are things that I have faced um, or have had very difficult time with or have gone through therapy, journaling, you know, doing a lot of things in order to either operate more efficiently, better, and actually have some love and kind and goodness and care in my heart um, or things that I still am confronted with day by day. So look through that, see whatever it is that connects to you that maybe you or someone that you love is dealing with. A few of these are um, highlighted, such as the strokes, because obviously that was pretty monumental in life, going through having injuries that led to uh, a torn artery in the back of my head that caused brainstem and cerebellar strokes. That sidelined me for a number of years. It's been about almost eight years, and I spent three in hospitals and nursing homes and hospice care, um, completely unable to speak or move, um, unable, I had to relearn everything, how to breathe, how to eat, all of that. Um, I've also historically prior to that have dealt with a lot of depression and familial and friend suicides, um, PTSD from all of these things that have gone on through life. Um, I've also found a lot of help through very, I guess, almost being relentless in that I was going to figure out a way to not feel like every single day was hell. So, and here's a truth that I've found in me and in the years, the experiences that I've had, that it doesn't matter how deeply we want good or happiness or that we want love and kindness. Wanting isn't the issue. Um, for some of us, we just can't get there. We can't get to bliss or to happiness or good or even receiving love from where we currently are. So this has been my reality. Um, in fact, over the years and doing certain things in a, to help recover from the strokes, um, I came to learn that me internally, my system, I processed love as an attack. There was no separation. So even didn't matter how much I wanted love and kindness, as soon as it was presented, everything in me shut down, went to red alert, like that it was nothing but an attack. Now I've come to view that as like, it was simply a miswiring, a misconnection. It was something that was lightly off in the code that pretty much destroyed my life. So for me, no feel good stuff ever helped. That never deeply aided me. Um, in fact, I think of the term like <laughs> toxic positivity. When you are hurting, when you're going through difficult times, when people do not know what all you have faced or tried to overcome from the past, they don't get that spreading a thin layer of positivity on it doesn't help. It just drives you down deeper into feeling alone and misunderstood, rejected, and possibly like no one can possibly understand and that I am the one person that is too flawed to actually get better. Now that is a lie, but that was part of what I had experienced for many, many years. So no general feel-good stuff really helped me, but I am drawn to my inner workings. Um, I believe that this is common to many cybersecurity and information security and IT personnel. We enjoy the, the networking, the architecting, the figuring out, the making networks work. We like going through and securing them and making sure that our deeply analytical abilities and possibly also our deep emotional and um, cognitive, our intellect abilities are used for a greater good. Um, I find that to be very common among 
this industry and it's a huge part of why I have been so drawn to it. So going from that general mindset of enjoying inner workings, I found that I liked getting to the nitty gritty of healing. Um, these are what is listed here are a few of the, the main things that I still feel influence my everyday operating. These are still things that color and shade everything that I do, even though now after 35 years for the first time, I'm no longer suicidal. I'm no longer feel despair and depleted. Um, these are still things to face, be faced with. And so just for me to you, to anybody who is here at this, um, going back to part of the reason why I titled this as Warriors, When Warriors Face Good, is that I feel it's very common for us to have had to insulate and put on armor to get through life. We, no matter what, have had to face many things. So if it's not you, maybe it's somebody you know, but that inner feeling of that you are a warrior, you have triumphed, you have come this far, I want it acknowledged. I want you to know that I see that and that I value that. Um, I also feel that for me, it's been interesting trying to switch over from being a warrior and being in a constant warrior mode to more being a true guardian of myself and my heart and my emotions and my daily anxiety and depression and ability to interact with the world. Okay. So um, here I'm going to mention a little bit about what happened after the strokes. As it's mentioned in my bio, um, I had these major injuries that reset me to being like a six month old. Um, I couldn't comprehend things. I couldn't speech. You know, I had no ability to use my limbs, anything like that. Part of what I did over the weeks and months and years of being completely disconnected from society was having to figure out where all this information that my body was taking in, what it meant, what words meant, how things worked. I, what I did basically was set up a very simple binary system inside that I then used to create a platform, a whole new working platform internally. Um, what you're going to hear in this journal is not only part of what, how you can take what was a very hard and stressful time and I was able to eventually find the good in it, but it also kind of gives you a chronicle of how I internally process to move from something that's absolutely shutting me down and destroying my physical functioning capability to being able to understand it and then actually receive more good internally. Okay. So here you could just sit back, relax. Uh, these are some things to think of. So why did ordering a free pizza cause complete system failure? Almost to the point of going to the emergency room and being completely shut down for weeks and weeks. Um, why did making a phone call to order free pizza cause this? That doesn't seem, that is not logical. That is not a something that I'm f comfortable with continuing. So how did identifying the actual cause of the shutdown prove good? And then how did it allow me to receive more good? Okay. So this is my journal from New Year's Eve, 2020, 5 p.m. Virginia. Call to order food. Was told I had to order enough to cover the delivery minimum, even with a voucher for free pizzas. Okay. Ordered boneless wings, garlic parm. Asked about hot flavors. She didn't understand. Changed words and re-explained. She got it. It was nice. Described three types of buffalo. 
I said, okay, and aren't there other flavors that are hot? She repeated the three. Oh yes, and aren't there some like hot garlic? Hang up. Well, that surprised me. Maybe she thinks I'm wasting time or that I'm being difficult. So I said to my brother, she hung up. He said, well, maybe it was disconnected. Wait a minute. In this moment, I started observing how conditioning from the past would mean I'd have to get angry. I'd have to go on about how bad it was, what horrible customer service, how dare they? I'm stunned very lightly and my gut feels sick. But those things, those words of how dare she, that anger isn't in me. So though that's what I know to do from watching people, I don't actually have to do them. I do notice now that physically speaking causes me to slow down inside and in my processing speed with this particular person. Okay, so I go through calling back. I'd like to finish my order, please. She said, what? I repeated. <sighs> oh, you wanted eight piece garlic parm, boneless wings, two pizzas, ranch, and blue cheese. Uh, no, I'd like one pizza, but first I'd like hot wings as well. Are there, I know there are buffalo flavors, but aren't there also like sriracha or heart, hot garlic? She had held long, exhaled long and with derision. No, there are mild, medium, or hot. It was so harsh. So many things are registering. My brain is rolling through every time I've been the recipient of that exact energy frequency before. It's unexplainably fast inside. Then I'm realizing all the ways I've seen to deal with it aren't me. So in this same space of hearing, also evaluating so quickly, how do I actually react? What's a possibility that's in me? And knowing I've seen these flavors on the website. So to speed up the reaction time physically, I said, 12-piece buffalo hot. Not what I want, but okay. Large thin crust with garlic sauce and pepperoni. As solidly and quickly as I could, I'm shutting down. I'm failing. I'm going to pass out. I'm lost. And those are the final words I can speak out to end what suddenly became a hellhole of desperation. My physical abilities are shutting and stopping. I feel my brainstem problems worsen. My core temperature is off. My blood pressure is changing. If someone talks to me, I'll stare. I'll lose all time. I can't not feel what was revealed in her tone and her energy. Because as I started speaking, I could feel energetically five separate streams of things from her. In her voice, I heard these things. And aside from my own, which were their own three separate streams, they each would feel a rapid and complete conversation. I have to speed up. I have to speed up internally, and I've got to fight to not black out. My own reactions take back place. All this is happening in microseconds. Me cognitively, cognitively aware of them and trying to adjust adrenaline, lungs, breathing, oxygen level and intake, and all of my histamines inside as well. All these simultaneously, simultaneous streams received. Now for you guys, I won't read them or go into that here, but there are these, I detail like the five separate things that her voice brought up. Um, so now all this knowing, all this interpreting happens in my mind or my subconscious and my consciousness simultaneously. And how do I respond in person right now on the phone? Do I get mad, be rude, stand up for me, tell her that I'm injured and autistic and she could be a little nicer? Does she functionally care and need to adjust for that? No, she's not here for this. So I breathe and I say, I'll pay cash. Because I know in my own higher calculating, the limited number of words I can get out before stopping words and having to fall to the floor. I'm thinking, 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 there's an ATM in the lobby, we can get cash somehow. But why should her anger cause me to be this incapable? 
There's a final shock inside her abject derision, hatred, and moral assassinations of me, and the rudeness covered by her mock pro voice. It's $31. It's $31 for my free pizza? How did I get here? I have to cry, scream, do something to dissipate her transferred energy, my creation of what it all means. I feel her pull away. I, she spins like she's off on some carnival ride. I just want to breathe and be calm, not thinking about whether each lung is opening. opening. Now, I'm not angry. I'm not sure about anything else but I've got to let it flow. I've got to let it flow through and out of me because I want calm and balancing. So what was the actual cause of this? I relax, I breathe, I check, and I check, and I check again. What buggered up my entire system? As I diagram it out internally, I find one main culprit. It was included in the vitriol and generic rudeness. What was it? If I find this common root of my compromise, I can upgrade for all future interactions. So in that packet of information I heard from her and in the packet of information of emotions that stirred in me was an emotion. It's what I and the dictionary call righteous care. I don't know this. I have no pathways for recognizing it apart from dissecting it and seeing what, it, what might be close in me. Righteous care. The sort her family shares when gathering for holidays. This frequency is unknown to me. Now that's not a problem, but receiving the whole packet, I couldn't connect or process through fast enough. Air, network gone. Air, unknown characters. Air, connection not found. Air, that particular energetic frequency of goodness that I've not cataloged or grown on my own. She shut me down. Weird. My inexperience with this type of good shut me down and nearly sent me to the emergency room. Not her rudeness. This good that she's had that I simply haven't experienced. Oh God, what do I do to reestablish some normal functioning? So reinforcing boundaries to not feel her stuff or that depth of hell again. I'm upgrading now to include, include that portion of lush love that was not known before. It's good to upgrade that good. Then I can receive. Okay. So this is here for all of us to breathe. It is also a reminder for me to go ahead and breathe. Let all of that go. So what becomes important here to me is what did I do to update my mental, emotional, and neurological systems to integrate that gift? Because though she was rude, and though that was horrible, and though I was down $31 on some free pizza, there was a gift. There was a gift. There was this type of lush love, this righteous care inside her tone that I simply had never experienced before or been ready to receive. So what did I do? My objective became what I could do what I could to upgrade me, not worry anything about her or that interaction. Now, for anybody who's going to apply this in their life or already does this, I do want to very clearly said that abuse is never okay. This is not me saying, oh, I'm just going to ignore abuse and focus on me and everything is keen and peachy. But this was a situation where I never had to interact with her again. There was no abuse and I don't believe she was even intending to have this effect on me. Um, but again, the only thing I can do is focus on upgrading me. So what I could do was internally allow that lush love, that righteous care to flow through me or as close as I could to find the closest match to that frequency or experience that she shared and move toward it from where I currently was. Now, the rest of that, it's 
piecing together what was then the closest in me to what I felt from her in righteous care. Parts of what I did to get that and to then further solidify it is through reading, finding things that elicited that same exact emotion, meditating, allowing it to go inside, journaling, um, talking to support groups, finding a loving friend who is not just a somebody who will listen to you, but somebody who actually knows how to create space and they don't tell you how to fix it and they don't tell you what to do about it, but allow you to come to that own conclusion. Um, then practice feeling that niche form of love, that lush love, that righteous care, practice internally feeling it. Set aside time to where I actually internally integrate it. So the focus becomes always on upgrading me and on loving me. Okay, so this picture I put here, this is from one of the nursing homes. This is where I had been in dark silence pretty much for years. I had, there was no TV, no reading, no writing, um, no music. Um, there was <laughs> no interacting except with the texts that came to wash me or feed me or do something like that. And going through being completely suicidal, but still also thinking there has to be a way out of this. Um, I put this picture here because now I can look back and it's not as if that was that many years ago overall and go, wow, I actually did get out of it. So the takeaway is sometimes warriors, good is hidden in the rough. <sighs> Opening your receptors to receive the good that is here is something that you can do. Um, these are some of the items that have helped me. I definitely want to call out like the Zyto Elite technology. Um, it goes along with technology and things that I've been working on to, for the InfoSec community, but also for helping um, connect autistic and nonverbal people to other people to be able to communicate, um, learning emotional awareness through using technology, through frequencies, through um, being able to connect one-to-one -one through a machine that's actually telling you this is happiness and you both feel it simultaneously. Um, these are various things that have helped. And I believe that's pretty much all of my slides. <laughs> so I will say thank you. Um, and I'm open to, I didn't really go much into my background or how I came to be involved in InfoSec. Um, obviously I am not an information security practitioner. Um, I do love it and I love learning but I came to it more from a, a need to survive through a very severe stalking situation that the finding that local law enforcement and even when it escalated to FBI and all that, that they simply didn't have the resources or even the knowledge to tell me how to protect myself. Um, that's how I came to be involved with the information security community. And actually it was through being in the situation of having been hunted for months um, and having already lost my home, having already been assaulted and kidnapped and everything by this person that I walked into a meetup just like you guys are doing here in Las Vegas called the Shadow Syndicate. And from there is where I started being able to get help. And it was a huge help. So the community has been huge to me, even during those times when, because of safety's sake, I couldn't talk about what was going on, but I was able to get real and solid good help from the community and from hackers who were willing to help me, no questions asked. And... I guess there I can 
Stop and share. Thanks, Nanny, so much for your, your sharing of your gift that, that defined tonight's talk. I hope everybody here has appreciated it and has takeaways that they can use in their daily lives. Sure. And um, like I said, I'm definitely open to questions and <laughs> more information. And if there's anybody who, if you ever want or having a hard time um, or are facing things, whether it's you or your family and you need somebody to talk to, you could reach out to me. I'm not on Twitter all the time, but <laughs> you can contact me there or by email. Um, definitely through Mental Health Hackers. Um, if you want more information on me, there's, uh, did an interview on Paul's Security Weekly that detailed more about the actual hacking the brainstem and cerebellum to make 45 years of recovery in five. Um, there's, and I have a couple of recorded talks from DEF CON Biohacking Village last year and the keynote from RVA SEC. Um, a few other things like that if you want more information on how I hacked my brain. A question for you, Mandy. Uh, how much time passed between the, the pizza and you journaling about it? Was that the next day, a week? No, parts of it started that night. Um, and then, no, because whenever I get in that mode and it's that distressing, I work on it. If I'm physically capable to write it out, then I will write it out. Um, but it would have been probably the next 14 to 18 hours. So it seems like it, you'd want to have it close enough that everything was still fresh, but not yeah. so fresh that you would be overwhelmed just trying to remember and, and think about it again. Yeah, it definitely, what I found works for me is that I do, I do feel that because of the physical damage, it's almost like I have to prioritize it. I have to prioritize it to right then and there because it's causing such extreme distress on my breathing and on functioning and shutting down all of these other um, systems that have, yeah, I've regained ability in, but all operate in ways that they weren't originally intended <laughs> to operate. So for me, it becomes vitally necessary that I get to some kind of resolution as quickly as possible. Um, some things I can, you know, set aside, but, and that's why it probably, it's different for other people because it, perhaps having a bad interaction like that, it doesn't create a complete system compromise. So you don't need to go into depth on that. But the way that I have learned to diagram out and figure out what it was and then upgrade to be able to actually allow my neurological system to handle good, that process is universal to all. That's all people, you can still work that way. Oh, I forgot a section of the talk. That's why I went so short. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I don't know what happened with the thing. We're supposed to go over the laws of unconditional love. Is everybody good with me doing that right now? <laughs> sure. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so another thing that I found very useful over time is that as I have worked through really bad memories, um, going through EMDR therapy, different types of therapy, as you clear the garbage, um, I genuinely wanted to fill that space with something good and useful. There have been a lot of things that have done that, but here um, I'd like to show you one, give you some laws of unconditional love that have helped me refill the space that was vacated by the garbage from the past and put good into it. Um, these are taken from a 
really great anonymous support group called Loving Groups that offers conference calls and Zoom calls. Um, but they've actually, they're going through a transition right now. So <laughs> they, the, that single group is going through a change in how they operate. Um, and these are based on information from a book called Real Love by Dr. Greg Baer. So there are, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. The definition for unconditional love in this context, where I am reading this, definition of unconditional love, unconditionally caring about the happiness of another person without any thought for what we might get for ourselves. There is only one kind of love, unconditional love. Everything else is counterfeit. Anything we use for a substitute for unconditional love is imitation love. Through no fault of our own, few of us have either received or given much unconditional love. And without it, we have a terrible void in our lives. Um, part of this is identifying our own unloving behaviors which all fall under the categories of either lying, attacking, acting like a victim, running, or clinging. And then these are abbreviated ways to be able to get toward un feeling completely unconditionally loved and then being able to give that to others. First, telling the truth. Truth, seen, accepted, loved. When we tell the truth about our unloving behaviors, behaviors, we create the opportunity for someone to unconditionally love and accept us. Until we are seen with our flaws and mistakes, we cannot feel love. Speaking in a loving group means that we give permission for a loving friend to help us tell the truth about our own unloving behaviors. If we simultaneously exercise self-control over using unloving behaviors while we tell the truth about ourselves, we can generally accelerate our feeling of unconditional love and happiness. Law of choice. People have the right to choose what they say and do. We cannot control the choices of another person, even when we believe our way is better, nor can they control ours. A relationship is the natural result of the independent choices we make. If we are unhappy with a relationship, we have three options. One, live with it and like it, two, live with it and hate it, or three, leave it. Controlling the other person violates their right to the law of choice, is not an option, and does not work. Law of expectation. We never have the right to expect that another person will do anything for us, will love us, or will make us happy. The one exception to this law is a very specific promise, I will call you tomorrow at 8.30 p.m. It does not include lofty promises like, I'll love you forever. Expectations lead to disappointment, anger, and unhappiness in relationships. So even when a very specific promise is made, proceed with caution. Law of responsibility. I am responsible for the choices I make and will face the natural consequences of those choices. I do not get to choose the consequences. I'm not responsible for the choices others make. Law of happiness. When I have the following, I experience genuine happiness. Feeling love, being loving, being responsible. Law of loving. Being loving toward others is more powerful than feeling loved in producing happiness. When I am unconditionally loving others, it doesn't matter if they reciprocate or not. Being loving is the happiest way to live. Okay, again, I will summarize real quick. So there's telling the truth, the law of choice, the law of expectation, law of responsibility, law of happiness, and the law of loving. And overall, that book plus, I mean, there's a lot of other things that have helped, but this is an incredibly good synopsis for patterns and ways that have produced the greatest and fastest change in me to get from despair to feeling happiness and being more calm, comfortable, con content, and able to freely be cap capable of giving to others. 
And I did send that. I believe that um, Mike posted that document in the Slack for your group. So that yep. document is there. And then again, I've just, of all of the many, many things that I have done <laughs> and gone through and the therapies and stuff, it's one very useful tool that I'm happy to turn over. Yeah, and it, and it is in our Slack channel for those of you who are in our Slack. Uh, John, I think you are. Uh, Dave, I don't think you are in our Slack. So if you need, I can email it to you if you want to share your email address. All right. So Shane, I think you had a question before we got into the rest of the talk. I did. I was curious uh, if you are still journaling on a regular basis. Is this something that you still do? Or I was just curious about that process for you. It is. Um, it's changed and morphed over the years. Um, and it actually got to a point where it was incredibly hard for me to write or to do anything like that. Um, and I'm glad now I, more recently i mean even in just the last two weeks so that was in january and then i would say there was a span of not wanting to do any of it for a long time <laughs> after that <laughs> um plus just dealing with life going through things like but yeah i still do find journaling drawing you know different things like that i'm happy now that as my physical abilities increase, I'm able to work more out physically. Um, so I do see how for some people, like perhaps journaling is replaced by, well, I'm gonna go work out or I'm gonna go do this or you know, doing something physical. Um, but aside from that, yeah, the, the journaling and then knowing whether it was either that I could just throw it away and I never have to think about it again <laughs> or being able to look back on information and reuse it to continue upgrading that has been incredibly helpful too yeah I, I gotta say I love your terminology of upgrading yourself I've never thought about that verbiage before mm -hmm. but as an IT guy, I mean, it just makes so much sense. It's just a simple way to, to, to think about the process. You know, I just, I love that. Oh, good. I'm glad because that's what makes sense to me. Like even you now my background wasn't in IT, but it was interesting that in those years of having to try to recraft an internal operating system, those were the words that made sense to me. It was like, well, I'm no, I need to upload stuff so that my body knows how to handle that sound or this stuff or moving or whatever it was. And now as I, and then when I started going to the um, meetups and talking to people, I'm like, I felt such an overlap between say what red teamers do or what, with what is actually going on physically and neurologically that it's okay for me to go, I need a patch. I don't know this emotion or this thing that you're talking about. That's not a failure. And I think it makes it so much more accessible to me who is incredibly analytical to go, oh, well, if I just start inserting this patch or I take this code from this person and I take these parts, I'm leveling me up. I like that it removes the shame or like thinking that it's some giant process that you've somehow screwed up when it's like, no, literally if I'm leveling up, I need to get the upgrades. <laughs> I've got to get the other information internalized. Yeah. Because I mean like the word self-improvement by itself just d internally defines you that you're deficient. Right. But you know, I can use an upgrade or a patch. I mean, that's, I just, I really like that verbiage. Good, good. I'm glad. And I think this is why I love this community because like, yeah, the, this is what makes sense to me to say, um, okay, I'm feeling all these things from people. Well, it's basically open source data and I'm going to mine through that data that what I'm feeling and take out the exact part that I need and that I want 
And then all of the rest of that is theirs. And I don't need to do a single stinking thing with it. But in doing that, then it's like I get more efficient and I can help other people. And it does, it helps. It helps me to, well, I don't think of computers as exactly follow, like computers themselves aren't our brains and our emotions. They don't work like we do. But the ideas of, we're basically all just trying to increase our networking ability internally. <laughs> You need your neurological system to be able to handle this. And with a lot of people being autistic and interacting with a lot of people who have Asperger's or are autistic or somewhere on the spectrum, um, I feel like we all just can get it so much faster and simpler. So I just out of curiosity, you don't have to answer this question but do you go to a lot of conferences? And if so, how does that affect the social aspects of dealing with being on the spectrum? Do you find there are times when you, you, you have to pull away and find your space or? Mm -hmm. um, again, I'm really new to this industry. So my first conferences were two and a half years ago. And then I was invited to speak at DerbyCon and the mental health hackers a couple times and I've attended now I think I'm gonna guess somewhere around 15 or 20 conferences and yeah it's brutal on sensory input um, I do have to be very mindful of how much I interact how much I talk um, Sometimes it's, it depends on who I'm around. Um, I do things like I wear hearing protection. I have glasses. I decrease sensory, you know, sensory stimuli as much as possible. Um, I may be in the room. Like I may only be out for short periods. Um, I do have a service animal and that helps um, a lot but it's there have been times where i am absolutely in complete and utter meltdown and cry um, and it's the hardest thing because internally i know that you know my brain is still functioning i'm still thinking and it's not as if like that because i'm in complete shutdown and i might be weeping laying on the ground um, in a hallway somewhere it's not that I want to be like that, but it's like my system is so overloaded and I feel for every single person who is introverted, has a hard time with senses or is on the spectrum or just not used to being around people, whatever it is. That's another reason that I love the community is you see how many people know that it's going to be hard to be there in person and are willing to do that because they know they might connect they might be able to share information like i see that on a very large scale at the conferences and so in some ways going to the conferences have also really helped and expanded my functioning ability um and i personally have found a lot more comfort in finding other autistic people that understand and then finding a lot of people who are absolutely fine with adjusting things to be able to, for me to be there. I think you're muted. Well, sometimes. Thank like you for answering that question. I appreciate it. Sure. Couldn't get my mute to stop. <laughs> okay, I couldn't get my unmute to, to work either. So I was going to say something. Um, so on your experiences, it, it's very interesting what you've seen at the conferences. And I had to say, I went to Microsoft Ignite last year in Orlando, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a conference of like 30,000 people uh, at, the, at the Orange County Convention Center. And it's, it's a lot of people. And the one thing I think Microsoft did really well 
was uh, catering uh, to those who may have sensory overload, uh, may not be comfortable talking with people, um, uh, just identif identifying and, and whatnot. And they, they provided space for, for that. They provided uh, pins you can wear on your, on your, on your, uh, what do you call it? Lanyard? Yeah. Yes, lanyard. thank okay. you. Pins that you can provide on your lanyard. Um, they provided headsets and, and stuff. And so I thought that was really nice to see uh, such a large company like that at a, at a big conference, um, taking that into account for, for people. That's huge. Yeah. And I, it is, it's such a level of acceptance and calmness that just comes from that being available and recognized. And I've got to say in my experience too, um, and having now worked some with Diana initiative and talking with a lot of people who are interested in the industry, um, a lot of women and disabled people and people who are struggling with emotional um, difficulties and traumatic experiences. I also <laughs> always have to say like, I, I am so impressed and amazed by the number of good men. Um, the number of guys and, and this is coming from somebody who like when I, well, obviously when I first was introduced to the industry, I was actively being hunted by my rapist and who had extorted and stole everything that I owned. I was coming in a very difficult, vulnerable situation. And the amount of help that came to me simply from being around large numbers of guys that were good, it's like immeasurable. And I don't feel like it gets complimented enough or brought up or is even something that the average white guy knows that he is still doing something good and is creating a, a wonderful space. And for me, created a lot of healing in a very technical place, but it actually gave me a whole new platform for learning how to function and being willing to function in society again. Um, I mean, even some other things I would say, like from my past, from prior to the strokes, and I always say a lot of memory has returned, but not everything. Um, I worked in construction and in what I did, it was 3% female. And so even in that, I feel like it's incredibly encouraging to be around InfoSec. And it's, I think the last numbers I saw that it was something like 21 or 24% female. Um, and I'll tell people, I said, still the, like, that's encouraging to me. There's still a long way to go. But what I see is a much more receptive and ready male population to boost um envies or female or any person i find it completely amazing that there's this much support for women um i've shown this to the group before but i think one of the best stickers i have on my laptop um besides the ilf sticker sorry shane um <laughs> is this one we rise by lifting others. So and we got to remember that. So. That sticker doesn't get covered up. So. Yeah, and I, I was taught, hearing, um, what was it, Shane talking about the ILF Fest, and I was thinking about how my first DEF CON, which was two years ago, 26, I guess that was. Um, I mean, it was wild and crazy. Like, obviously, I was not in the industry. I didn't have any background. I didn't know if physically I was going to be able to handle being in 30,000 people <laughs> or anything like that. Now, I'm from Las Vegas, so I was already in Las Vegas. I didn't have to travel or anything. My family is there. Um, but it was phenomenal to me, again, the accessibility of being able to listen to a speaker or find somebody who had information, like you mentioned Chris Roberts, and then talking with Neil, and then with different people. My very first conference, 
who were ready and willing to take my ideas on technology seriously. Um, like what better gift can they give? And I think that's what I see like here in the, the community and the fact that you were willing to go ahead and keep these meetups going because we can immediately get to talk to people who have fantastic experience and background. Well, we certainly appreciate hearing from you and getting those insights and hearing about your experience. Oh, thank yeah, you. Definitely. Thank you. I'm sure it's a little wildly different than the normal tech talks, <laughs> but, but I do feel like we are tech. We may as well <laughs> discuss it. No, it's those it's those differences that are a good thing. I mean, it allows us to see things from a different perspective, and and maybe trigger off something that others, uh, like you tonight, have brought to the table for us that maybe some of us don't get uh, exposed to or exposed to often enough. Uh, yeah, this was a, a tech talk about the biotech that runs all of our hardware. Yeah. Exactly. You know, one of the other things we, we've talked about before is, uh, and I've run into people, say like the, the meetup coming at on Thursday with Southwest Florida Regional Technology Partnership, um, because it brings up, brings in a variety of people uh, to their uh, tech talks. It's, it's interesting to meet up with people and tell them, hey, we've got this community here. We've got Southwest Florida SEC, uh, who does meet monthly, monthly about cybersecurity and information security and um, have people that are not in the industry at all just get really excited like oh you know, how can i learn more how can i come out or say something along the lines of i don't think i could ever contribute mm -hmm. I, I don't know why i would attend and then talk to them about well here's the reasons you should attend not because it's technical in nature or because you're going to be learning about the newest, hottest firewall or the newest breach that we have every day or anything like that, but that it's, it's your perspective that you're going to bring to our group that's going to help us. And, and, and I think, you know, we've had people that have come in from sales, from user experience and user interface uh, type work, from uh, marketing, I guess that's sales, but uh, from the, from financial that is not part of security, but like in financial and, you know, it's, it's that, uh, it's just those experiences and ideas that people can bring that can teach us something and how we could apply to what we're doing in our daily lives or our daily jobs. Um, you know, I guess, I guess I'm cheating a little bit. One of the easiest ones to, to pick on that's applicable is that user interface, user experience type work. Um, because, you know, we talk about needing security to be more transparent to the end user, security is hard. And one of the things that we continue to fail out is fail at is the end user because security tends to make things difficult for the end user to do, and then they're looking for a way around it. Um, so trying to bring that experience in and say, okay, what can we do to be secure and keep our business and our users secure but make it transparent to them so they don't even know. Um, and I think that, that's a, a good goal of why we would want somebody who has that user experience, um, UI, UX type stuff that they can bring to the tables because they're going to look at it a completely different way. I always find that's uh, the best way to uh, contribute. And how I like to is to, to use Ghostbusters uh, terminology to cross the streams. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm also a uh, security adjacent, not uh, uh, full-time security. I'm more data analytics and, and things like that. Uh, but I've got experience in everything from uh, theater and comedy and film uh, to uh, uh, literature. Uh, I ran a publishing company a long time. Gamings. Uh, the things I know from my friends who are involved in uh, uh, outreach, uh, working with uh, you know, prisons or ministry uh, and things like that. And then all the uh, many, many aspects of tech, uh, hardware, software, data, security, all those things. Uh, it's when we find something in this area, say, hey, we, we have this uh, this thing we, we do in my costume group that might really help 
with your, you know, social engineering pen tests. Oh, wow. Bring out the costume people in, you know, things like that. Well, and isn't it interesting and I think amazing how, speaking of that, how we as humans, as mostly human, <laughs> like <laughs> we can extrapolate information from one situation or from one thing that we went through and apply it in a totally new way, which I was just reading some articles on artificial intelligence and then books and stuff I read on artificial general intelligence. And that's still such a delineating factor is that no matter how much machine learning is done, like if we're just doing machine learning, it's unless they are trained on that exact thing, they don't really extrapolate and reapply it in a multitude of situations. Now they may be able to process through m many alternate, you know, possibilities in that one situation faster than we do, but they don't just, what would that be? Um, not simultaneously, but they don't instinctively <laughs> take stuff from a, comedy show you did one time and be able to apply it in this office meeting over here yeah a, or, she, a machine can't uh, spontaneously imagine mm -mm. it doesn't see like those it can look for i always think of it more of like it looks for patterns but not patterns that are connecting because of an emotional or intuitive connection but because it's raw hard data that okay yeah this pattern of oh well this phone number popped up this many times this often <laughs> which isn't the same way that we as humans actually connect and form memories and store information neurologically and uh, we can also find a a lack of pattern like oh i noticed this thing is missing a lot but a machine might only look at what is there and look for patterns in what is there uh, you know, we, we might look, if I'm looking at the, the painting behind you, I could say, well, I, I see very little orange, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and a machine would say, well, I see uh, 733 different uh, specific colors, and it, it might not notice uh, something that is missing. Mm -hmm. At uh, layer eight, uh, two weeks ago, I spoke about uh, imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is, uh, you know, like, like you, Mandy, I've been to conferences for lots of different subjects, uh, uh, science, art, uh, ministry, uh, medicine, all kinds of things. And all the big conferences have panel discussions about imposter syndrome. <laughs> it isn't limited to one group or one industry. <laughs> exactly. What's imposter syndrome? Uh, feeling like uh, you are... Uh, you don't belong uh, uh, where you are, that uh, uh, you're secretly a fraud and you're going to find out, uh, your friends are going to find out any second, you're going to get fired because people think you're better than you are and you're not. What's with all that? So is that based on the individual or the environment that they're in? Uh, individual. Okay. Uh, if, if feeling a, a thrust beyond your capacity. But do you, don't you think the environment can have a play in that, though? That it's, if you're in an unhealthy environment or a toxic environment, it can uh, amplify those feelings well, that you have? Anytime I think that you're in a prejudiced environment, whether it's intentional or not, if it doesn't matter how much, like if I walk into a situation, it doesn't matter how much I actually know or can do if every single person there has already shut down that it's not possible that I could know that. So then I feel like that it becomes an imposter syndrome that would be based on environment. It's not that I'm a fraud, but any, any effort I make to correct their view is taken like that I am, I am being fraudulent because it doesn't fit their view of me. Mm -hmm. It also works in an overly positive environment. Everybody thinks, oh wow, you were gonna do so great, you're gonna knock this out of the park. Like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Go on. We, we trust you. Do it. I have no idea what's happening here. It could also be that, like, for example, you do actually work with like people who are just like you know, like way more cutting edge. You know, been in the industry longer, and you're kind of like newer. And though you may be 
you know, you might be, you know, smart and experienced. You're just not at that level yet. So you're comparing yourself to the people around you. Uh, that is a lot of it that, uh, I, uh, all the experts in my field, they know all these things that I don't, and I'm obviously not them. So why do people think I know what I'm doing? Well, and I know I always, through life, I always assumed and a large part of why I didn't talk very much before was I assumed that anything that I could notice or think couldn't be that complex. So obviously everybody else knew it. So to me, it became an efficiency thing too, but it was also then me assuming that anytime I did speak, I would be taken for an idiot or that they already knew it. It was plain as day. So why would I bother talking? Why would I share? Or even though you understand it in your brain, trying to explain it to somebody else so they understand it is a challenge. It totally is. Yeah, if you know it, but you can't explain it, then you don't really know it. <laughs> well, that's, I sometimes think that's unfair. I get that. But then also, well, of course like, it's, unfair. it's, well, because if, <laughs> this is something I've learned deeply and intrinsically, is every neurological system uses words differently. We all assume mm -hmm. that we're going to use these words and they're going to have these general accepted definitions. But every single neurological system uses words and categorizes them completely differently. So if I know it, but I can't explain it in a way that your brain and your background patterns understand to the exact same level I do, is that really a f my fault that I don't know it? That if I can't explain it to your neurological system, it's a default, I mean, a fault on my side, it becomes unfair. And I get that, but I feel like a lot of times it's that Somebody who can speak completely, simply, and compassionately to where everybody can connect and learn is rather rare. Um, and I say, like, I mean, I, I think of Jesus whenever I yeah. say that, <laughs> because that's what he did. That was his part of his complete example. Um, was being able to connect to large audiences in simple ways with timeless truths that could be repeated. Not everybody has that level of skill. <laughs> yeah. And I think I've learned in IT support over the years, from years ago, is that when I'm talking to other IT folks that work in the same field as I do, I talk a certain way. But when I'm talking to somebody who maybe works in a different area, not IT, you know, they understand the problem that they have. They just don't explain it the same way the IT people will. Mm -hmm. So I need to understand how they understand it and be able to talk in the way they understand to help them with their situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's coming up with that common language. Mm -hmm. you know, where, yeah. where do we have that halfway point where we have the, we're speaking the same language. Yeah. We don't exactly have the Rosetta Stone <laughs> sometimes uh -huh. between security and, and whether it's consumers or even our partners and our different departments we work with. So we need human babble fish, like actually in between us. Yes. <laughs> just, just thinking of the little fish from, you know, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. Even though it's English to English, it's still required because it's all so different. Yeah. Person to person. And we talk about that. And, and the other English English, I mean, we talk about that in our household is uh -huh. whether it's UK English, Australian yeah. English or American English. We're speaking English, but we can't understand each other sometimes. So, and American English, what do you mean? Uh, Texas? Do you mean New York? Do you mean California? Yeah, wh which English do you mean here in America? So, I'm going to tell you. So, as I was relearning to speak and to understand words, understand speech and sound and everything like that, it was, it's been funny because there would be times where as I'm going through, and checking like my, my frequencies and doing these different things as to what I'm trying to process internally, it might come up. I feel velociraptor. And for me, for my neurological system, that was exactly the closest word that I could come to because of whatever associations I had with velociraptor. And so <laughs> I'm like, do you know how much time it took me to get to that word to describe it? And then nobody understands what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever I say. 
<laughs> no, I feel Velociraptor right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like I'm doing my part of my side. I figured this word out. <laughs> Could you, uh, could you describe what feeling Velociraptor is like? <laughs> okay, let me try. Let me think about a situation where I felt Velociraptor. I can tell you part of like what it actually would break down to in more commonly accepted terms. So give me a second here. I'll show you some journaling right here. <laughs> so <laughs> Velociraptor, it's 14 separate emotions four memories and pulls from three different categories. So if we summarize it though, that's okay, your Velociraptor first, program. My Velociraptor program? Well, it's mm -hmm. just whenever I'm saying I feel Velociraptor, it actually is a summary of that I'm experiencing these 14 different emotions that are combining with four different memories, and they come from three separate categories of functioning. Um, so I can break that down and I can tell you, well, then I have to just keep going to figure out where I actually need to say, what I would need to say for somebody else to have common ground. So, um, like what you were asking, I can say like the first category, first grouping of emotions is under a overall, like a, the overriding emotional category of anger. Um, the next overriding category is respect. The next overriding category is grounding in to run or to fight. Next category is would fall under hatred. The next category would fall under It's something that my neurological system categorizes as being magic. Anyway, so I could keep breaking that down and go as deep <laughs> as I want in getting the words, but the short summation of all of that would be I feel Velociraptor, which to me makes complete sense, <laughs> but not to anybody else. <laughs> Did you have to go through a lot of those types of things? I mean, just like relabeling and refiguring out, I guess, I guess things that we take for granted because we slowly built that up and then right. never, never really lost it. But then to have that taken away, um, I just, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard awesome. time wrapping my head around that. That's amazing. Um, I did to think about that hundreds of thousands of rounds of categorizing things of figuring like hundreds of thousands of what I would call a um an a session or an episode which might be taking one tiny impulse that I felt or one thing and figuring out does this is this an a word is it an emotion is it a response? Is it something from a neurological system? So having to figure out that one tiny thing and rebuild, and I mean, even trying to figure out words, like figuring out, well, then what, what word does fit this exact thing that I'm thinking or feeling? Um, if I've separated this out, like I've have all of this input and all of these sensations and things going on in me, and I have this like, cause there were parts where like I had no internal voice. So it was more of like an impulse. Like I have an impulse. How do I start categorizing one portion of that to start making any sense of any of it? Because if not, it was just kind of like having this gigantic data cloud that was weighing down on my system 
all the time. There was no, there was no logic to it because there was no, there were no words. There were no, um, it had not been mapped out. Like how I think of it and view it as more of like when you're architecting a network, it had not been plugged into its place to where you could actually just go, hey, that right there is an impulse mm. versus an emotion versus a word. So you had no framework to hang it on. You had to there rebuild was, your own framework. Right. Okay. Um, and I started with a yes and no, with using my tongue against my teeth, since I couldn't really move or control anything. Um, my eyes operated independently, part of why I still have to wear the eye patch at times. So I couldn't use my eyes. Um, sound was killing me and <laughs> became, it was hyper acute. So it's kind of like my, my power of attorney described it as all of my insides were on the outside, but they also had no, like you're saying, there was no framework. There was no reference as to what the crap this was. And, and I couldn't speak to have anybody tell me. I couldn't have somebody just, I mean, you know how awesome it would have been if like I could have had just somebody network into my system and start putting things into categories for me, mm. <laughs> building a framework. But that wasn't possible. Um, plus, it was also like continuously kind of life and death. Because if I couldn't explain to the doctors what was going on, who was possibly going to help me? It's like it was your, uh, your first day possessing a human body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and there being like, oh man, it was it was crazy. Like it was, I'm shocked at how much of it I remember. Um, I'm glad that other people don't have to go through it. Um, like, or that you go through it whenever you're four months old <laughs> or you go through it <laughs> a long time ago that you're not also having to try to figure out insurance and healthcare <laughs> while <laughs> learning how to create a synapse that will actually connect to that muscle in your neck and then you know what all these words and emotions and things are but yeah so Shane to your question it was hundreds of thousands of rounds and I did relegate as much as I possibly could to my subconscious or to my um, neurological system and then I can still access things from that without it weighing down my brain or memory um, I know that may not make sense, but <laughs> that's, how it, um, that's how it works for me. Many of us uh, feel overloaded. And as we grow up, we, we build generalizations. And that's how we deal with not being information overload. And that's how we connect those synapses. By you categorizing these things, is that kind of building that same thing, that generalizations, you don't have to deal with every minute detail again? The next time around? I would call that more prioritizing within me. Um, that would fall like the, to me, the categorizing is like the framework where I start putting, okay, we're going to go with these main things. Everything that I'm experiencing is either a, a biological reaction or it's, it's mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, or you know, whatever at that time, like I might need another category. And then from there, there's subcategories and subcategories and subcategories and subcategories until I got like this one thought or feeling or something, figure out where it goes way back in the subcategory is more getting the precision to be able to integrate it and make a new connection, but it never becomes a that, that to me doesn't become a generalization. Um, generalizations come from, say, I'm facing this or I'm feeling all of these things inside. And this is where I had to really trust myself and really get to know my biological system in that what actually is the most needed at this exact moment. Um, for my best physical outcome 
long term. That becomes prioritizing, which then by default shifts everything else away from being the priority. And everything else becomes a general, you know, it's just a general cloud of information then. Um, but I personally, I, I mean, I do generalize and stuff as I've gotten better, but I feel like what you're asking about isn't so much lumping information to take a general thing from it. I still stay very precise and exact what I did personally was just work incredibly hard to speed up my processing and my ability to be exact more quickly. Oh, thanks. That, that helps a lot. So it's, it was more these categories are for understanding and for where they fit in. Mm -hmm. And um, then from that, you build your connections. And from that build the connections. And then it's that like once I figure out where I fit where it fits in, it's no longer a priority. Like then I, I know it's categorized. It's somewhere back there. It's like you're moving it back to its place. It can be it can be accessed again. So similar, I would think, like to doing cloud backup or to doing anything like once you know it's back there. I don't need to focus on it. So it becomes just a general background noise. Um, but in the moment, my, I was not willing, I guess, to do too many generalities. And the only way I could really see was that I needed to speed up my functioning, that instead of folk being able to process just one thing at a time, I needed to get to where I was processing four things at a time or eight things at a time or 12 things at a time. So then uh, to me, I just think of it as like I became like a quad core processor or, a, you know, a 12 core processor. Um, but I can still break down what's going on inside each of those processes if I need to. That makes sense. And when you're cataloging these things, it's or, or when you're categorizing, you're actually cataloging, almost indexing them because they're available mm -hmm. for later. Yes. Um, and then it did get to a point, like the first few years of doing that, uh, it was a lot more minute. You know, I think it's like when you're learning anything, like you can do, my dad used to say this thing, he's like, you'll do more the second day by accident than you could the first day on purpose. Like as you become familiar and as those pathways are built up, then processing speed for me would increase. Um, I had another point that I guess I just forgot. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, the categorizing, indexing, then it does become simpler because I, then <laughs> I set parameters within me. So it, I literally, it's like running a query. I'll set parameters within me of like, I need to access this information and I want it only if I set up a catalog within me that for my physical being needed to know if it was going to be overall helpful for me. I set it as a, that this thing has to fall on this scale in a certain way. So I set the parameter that I don't want to access that information if doing so is going to be on a scale of one to a thousand. If it's anything less than a 500 in that it's positive for me, I don't want it. So in that way, it gets filtered out. And I become very specific on only then focusing on and bringing in what is actually um, beneficial or positive to me, but I make a lot of numerical uh, breakdowns or barriers um, that over time and with habit of doing it gets to where it's like it's being relegated to intuition, but it's not actually intuition. It's that I'm running this query this way with these parameters and I don't want the other information. Gotcha. And, the, and if it's the case, it's filtered out, you never see it again. But some of it almost sounds like an access control list where you've dealt with the situation where it happened with the pizza situation before, but you have these rules you've built to catch when they're happening. Mm -hmm. So you can filter them out. Because if you just discarded it, 
you would have to deal with it all over again. So you're building exactly. these rules so next time you can handle it the right. same way you did. And I found almost the inverse to be exactly true that whenever something comes up, let's say a traumatic experience, that in accessing it and confronting it and starting to categorize and deal with it, I could also set parameters that, well, I don't want to go through, like there might be 1,433 occurrences of this particular emotion that is traumatic to me. I don't have a single bit of interest in going through all 1,433 of those. So I will then query my system of how many times can we go through this in order to clear all 1,433? But I and then maybe it comes down to where I only have to actually go through it eight times. And in doing it those eight times, it's like the cluster that it goes to all of these other connected, which have been labeled to my body traumatic experiences, now clearer. It's a bit of a subject change, but we were talking about the InfoSec community and things like that in the past, and then we got into some other things, but I want to bring it back up because to me, I want to pat the InfoSec community on the back. Um, I've always really cared about the InfoSec community, but it takes the people who are InfoSec adjacent, the people who aren't in the industry, for them to come back and they look at us. And uh, yeah, obviously we have bad apples. We have... We have people who yeah. are very prejudiced, but overall as a community, community, InfoSec is extremely helpful. And they're like the first ones that were helping with the Australian fires, building ma or making their own masks and stuff. So my wife, other people on the industry, they, they get into Twitter and they're just hooked. And they're not hooked because of the technical piece, they're hooked at the passion and the heart that the industry has. Mm -hmm. I don't want to lose that. And I think that's that's where we really shine. Um, and, and it's not talked about as much because we're looked at as hackers with hoodies on. Mm -hmm. But these are the first people out there that would want to help, help out. Well, I and along those lines, I think that's fantastic. And one of the biggest dichotomies that I see is that hackers themselves think that they are antisocial or that they are introverted or that they aren't comfortable with people when in reality, they are the ones that are willing to show up in their pajamas and create their own comfort. Like this is huge that they are putting aside societal, you know, standards or something and are actually, I think in a lot of ways, more connected and more comfortable with other people. You just don't need as much physical interaction to get the same depth of connection. Russell is just extremely inclusive uh, of community. I mean, e even if it's not necessarily what you agree with exactly, you've got the furries at DEF CON, um, uh, very much behind women's rights and women's equality. But overall, InfoSec is very, very, very much um, the type of people that believe that every person deserves a voice and everyone is, is equal. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, that is something that also spreads. And that's, that's the message I like to get out to people outside of security is like, come look at this group. They're just really good people. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. I found it amazing that, again, just going back to my first DEF CON, the very first day I had been there, I came home, my, my father came and picked me up and we were back at his house and I mean, I was wiped and thrashed and tired and everything from that. And yet whatever it was that I said or whatever I told him about the community, and it wasn't very much because I wasn't capable, but um, whatever it was that I said, he goes, it sounds like you've found your family because it sounds like a giant family. And that kind of took me by surprise. <laughs> I was like, wow, I guess so. Yeah, that, that's just so awesome. For instance, my wife, uh, who's assisting me with my uh, Sarasota InfoSec community, she's there because she is a event planner. 
now she's hooked. She's on Twitter following InfoSec more than I am. She's just absolutely, she's telling me all kinds of stuff that's going yeah. on. She's reading the news, telling me when conferences are coming up. Did you hear this person? Says, and she knows their personality inside and out way more than mm -hmm. I ever knew these people because she's paying attention to them on Twitter. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's just a great community and she's been hooked by it as well. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, that's, that's how I get, um, that's who I always know who to talk to is I talk to John's wife. Cause then I know he's not seeing anything <laughs> but when we try to, when we try to plan, when we try to plan a couple of things now, it's been, okay, I got to talk to John's wife. Cause yeah. <laughs> she has the time. She has the event planning background. Yeah. She's definitely the one to talk to. Yeah. I mean, to your point and, you know, finding a family and, you know, it's been really, I think even more apparent during our work from home, uh, situation that we were in the last couple of months when states started locking down and you know the conferences did move to virtual where they could and new conferences popped up and you know our meetups not only did we have our meetups but we had the uh, uh, we had virtual happy hours so yeah you know in between our meetups which were you know only once a month we decided you know maybe we do need to have some just some virtual social events where we just get together and chat and didn't necessarily have to be about security. Sometimes it was, and sometimes it wasn't. And sometimes it was, you know, a lot uh, of, you know, a number of people starting out in a group and next thing you know, it's midnight and there's still a couple of people left still talking, you know, and that happens. And, but it brought, I think it brought a lot of comfort for the people that were involved. I know John, you guys did some, uh, at least one virtual happy hour that I joined and, and we had a couple ourselves Shane had has had a couple now that I've attended that have been great. Um, uh, that that yeah. last one was just we were just losing our mind laughing so hard it was yeah. crazy. We had a we had a volunteer who decided that he would do a deep fake of our founder, and so he was doing that live during the happy hour, and we were just it was it was really funny. But yeah, to your point. It's, you know, I mean, this is a great group of people. I spent many years in the sea level arena going to all kinds of business conferences. And, you know, I mean, I'd, all, all over, I mean, super, super high end stuff to, to small conferences. I hit my first Derby Con at five, Derby Con five or six, and I was hooked. I was just like, it was so fascinating. And the people were fascinating. And what I loved was I had more intelligent conversations with people who, frankly, didn't always look so intelligent <laughs> on the outside. Yeah. I had more fascinating conversations in one weekend than I had had in years with the business groups with the, that I, I had gone to. And I was mm -hmm. just like, yeah, this is, I want to be here. I don't know why. I don't know what I'm doing, but I love this. Well, if your conversations were fascinating and intelligent, you must not have talked to me. <laughs> well, I just met you last year, Dave, so. Just, <laughs> you weren't part of the first Derby Con experience for him. Uh, we, we've I been, I've, first yeah, one might we've have been seen for years, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've only missed one of them. Yeah. And I was and only at the last two. I just two, didn't know but... about the first one. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, guys, I got to run. Uh, this has been wonderful. I am Good. so happy I attended. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm definitely better off for having met you. So it's, oh, uh, cool. it's been Thank you. wonderful to be here tonight. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Shane. So, Shane, and, oh, how do we find out about the right, ILF Shane. Fest? Yeah. I'm sorry, say again? Uh, how, ILF how do we find out about ILF Fest? Oh, uh, we're going to start putting it all over social media soon. So okay. Thursday, I think we're going to have a meeting and then we're just going to start posting and um, hopefully we can just drive enough people who can give a little bit that'll help get us moving. So it's, you know, right now, if you're a non COVID charity or if you're a non black lives matters charity of some sort, everything's dried up. I mean, it's just, and I get it, but that's the reality that we're in. So yeah, back in March, Louisville was going to have a, a human trafficking summit uh, and I was going to go and find out, you know, what I could and, uh, you know, ways that I might be able to get, get ILF involved, but then it got canceled because uh, that was the onset of everything else. Yeah, yeah, I know. And that, that's why we're just kind of like, okay, 
what can we do? You know, what are givens? What can we, you know, what's in the bag, right? All right, well, we've got these people and we can try these things and we can at least have fun trying. So let's go for it. And so that's what we're going to do. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't anticipate anything, you know, truly insightful or earth shattering, but hopefully we'll have a lot of fun. Raising the money. And I was, um, let's say ILF. And in fact, Neil's talk at DEFCON 26 was that whole experience was one of the, a pivotal changing point <laughs> in, in my life. But um, I definitely was drawn to the ILF focus and I believe from because of partly two of my back uh, my past experiences and it's another way that I think is just perfect you know how like um, Karen talks about hackers being the internet's immune system mm. have you ever heard about mm. that I haven't no um well having I because I worked for police department in the past and in my minimal experience and then going through this whole giant stalker situation, which wasn't just a normal stalker. It was a man who had armed, kidnapped people in the past and had plans to continue kidnapping young girls and wanted me to carry this out with him and do run all of his criminal enterprises and stuff. And I didn't agree. And um, it became a, a giant thing. Um, but it's, to me, it's just, again, seeing like the, the absolute amazing ability that the InfoSec community has mm -hmm. to produce real and consistent good. Um, it's one of the most beautiful things in the world. Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, this, this is a job. It's still a J-O-B, but trust me, it is better than any J-O-B I've ever been at in my entire life, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I am just, I feel privileged every day. There's something, you know, honestly, there's some days I don't want to go to work, but mm -hmm. the reality is of all the jobs I've ever done, what's better than going to work and being able to do good while you're there? So, yeah, it's, I love it. It's an honor to do it. All right, That's guys. Awesome. Th thank you all so much. Didn't mean to divert the the conversation back to us there, but how dare you say something useful and meaningful? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, man. Uh, thanks, Shane. It was awesome <laughs> to join us and have my two favorite hey, thanks, speakers Shane, for from, being here. Uh, layer eight on here. So. Oh man, what a nice uh, what a nice thing to say. <laughs> I'm I'm very anxious to see that because I have no idea how it went. So. Yours was one of the best talks. It was incredible. Whoa, I, thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. What was well, it titled? What was thank it on? You. Uh, it was... Um, see, so what was the name of it? The, the name of it was OSINT and a Dark War. Uh, see, the, hold on. See, now you had to go and ask me. Dang it. <laughs> well, on, no, I had you. hoped to attend. Like, they had... They were very nice and had sent me um, a ticket because I had helped with some accessibility stuff with disability stuff while the original planning for the physical conference. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't, but I, so I kind of remember the talk schedule, but I don't really. I mean, I've heard uh, Shane talk before on uh, different subjects and he even did one for SwiftleSec here. But the, the thing is for that, I think that was the best way to describe um, the the mission that ILF has mm. and what they're truly fighting against and and explained so much um, and trust me it was a little dark uh, but yeah. it explains so much what you're fighting against and, and it really anybody who hears that would be a hundred percent wanting to support this to to continue it and what hurts so much was the fact that you shared a story about another group had similar ideas and they just became disheartened right. and decided that this was too much of a fight. So what it's really about is changing one life, making mm -hmm. a better point. And then it just makes the whole thing worthwhile. Don't try to look at the overall um, situation and how many 
uh, how, how many situations are out there that are actually mm -hmm. happening? Because you're going to feel overwhelmed and feel like you're not helping if you, if you worry about numbers. Um, so I thought, I thought it was really important and keep the fight up. And especially since, like you said, you're having a hard time getting people to sponsor you at this point. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, you know, and that will switch back around. We just have to live through it. And so I, I think we will, but uh, and I got so Chris Hagnagy's book too. I've been reading that lately. That's brilliant. And, and so just uh, the whole social engineering piece, um, I, I obviously was a Kevin Mitnick fan back in the day. So that's what I consider was social engineering, but there's so much overlap. And what I really like what Chris Hagnagy speaks about is the fact that it's not about, um, it, it's not the, the social engineering uh, stops when it comes to hurting somebody. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't draw the line on the pen test side. We absolutely need to draw that line when it's not technical anymore and we have a human on the other line mm -hmm. and yep. so that's huge and that just speaks to the whole ilf the, the whole thing he's doing is social engineering and uh i support that 100 percent. man that that is awesome thank you for saying that oh yeah there you go <laughs> nice. nice shirt good job awesome man <laughs> so the the title was a a practical he's a heavy book is also an audio book yeah. Yes. Yeah, because Chris reads his own. So and that helps because the first mm -hmm. one he didn't read and a lot of it kind of got he lost. He lose a lot of it then. Yeah, yeah. So the title of the talk was A Practical Application of OSINT in a Dark World. Okay. And so that's the way I had to try to frame that. And I actually had to lighten that talk a lot compared to the last one because the last one I was asked to give, they were like, no, we want you to open up and tell what it's what it's really really like and i'm like are you sure people want to hear an hour of that and they're like yes i'm like okay you got it we'll do that so this one was actually lightened up quite a bit so i'm mm -hmm. glad it sounds like maybe there was a good balance struck so thanks for the kind words guys i i really appreciate hearing that it was All great right. getting to talk to you meet you thank you thank you all right have a good night, y'all. Thank you. Thanks, you too. Have a good night, Shane. Bye, Shane. Well, everybody, I feel like I need to wrap, too. My dog keeps coming over. He missed his dinner time. I was going to ask <laughs> you like... what kind of emotional support animal you have. <laughs> um, I actually have a medical alert and mobility assistance service animal, and uh -huh. he's a golden retriever. Aw. I saw him peek around on your right yeah, side he's, earlier. Yeah, um, he keeps laying down like over here by my feet and stuff. Like, um, I think Dave's met him. Yeah. Aww. Yeah. But, um, yeah, he's been good. He went to his first, he went to De DEF CON and Derby CON and all over the place. Nice. Yeah. Manny and I kept going to the, the same sessions at Derby CON. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> We'd like stand in line next to each other and got to know each other. <laughs> Select the same talks constantly. <laughs> and it was great. It was awesome. <laughs> so thank you all very much for having me here and for the awesome conversation. Yeah, thank Same. you. Thank you so much for making yourself available when we reached out. I really appreciate you coming out and, and telling us your story and, and helping us out. Um, yeah, I, like, I'm going to echo what I think Shane was saying is I, I definitely feel better having met you and, and listened to you cool. in, in this meeting. So I really appreciate it. Uh, that helps me a lot to hear too. So thank you very much. Hopefully we'll see you at some of the same conferences since we're kind of in the same region. I know it's incredibly possible. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we cross paths. We can still, uh, I feel like it's at this moment for me anyway, without having the physical conferences to attend, in some ways it almost makes it faster and easier to get to see people again because of having more virtual opportunities. <laughs> yeah, if, if I was going to a physical conference, I could go to, you know, maybe two a week, depending on when they were scheduled. But, mm. you know, with this, I'd go to eight conferences in a week if I want to. It's great. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking about. Like, it's been great with the 
the happy hours and different things that I have been able to join, I still am limited more than maybe the average person on my physical ability, even virtually, but um, it compared to what my life was last number of years, <laughs> it's so much more socially full with really good hearted people in interacting with all these virtual virtual opportunities to connect. But thank you all. See Michelle, Stephen, Eric, John, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Bye, everyone. Hey.